This episode is brought to you by Toku. If you are planning to launch a token, already have a live token, are granting employees or contractors vesting token awards, or are just trying to figure out how to take care of taxable token events for your team, from easy to use token grant award templates through tracking vesting to managing tax withholdings, make it simple today with Toku. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Empire. Very special up today. We have Jan Van Eck, CEO of Van Eck Funds, and Martin Leinweiber. I have a horrible German accent, so I'm sure I botched that, but uh, digital asset product strategist at Market Vector Indexes, which uh, Van Eck owns. So Martin, Jan, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks, Jason. Great to finally hey. talk. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, Jan, our, uh, I have to ask, are the rumors true? So our producer said that he was listening to a podcast episode with uh, Howard Lindzen, actually. And you mentioned that Empire is your favorite crypto podcast. We got to get it out of the way. Is that a, is that a true statement? That's my it's my most favorite mm -hmm. listen. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I learned, I'm a trad spy guy. Let's get that um, on the table right away. And um, I think, Martin, you're a listener, too. Um, I had a lot to learn on the tech side, and uh, after a couple of Patrick O'Shaughnessy, uh, you know, pods in 2017, yeah, I, I tried. I tried to understand most of what you guys talk about. It's funny. I feel like the the, the Patrick three part series. I think he called it Hash Power or Hash Series. I forget what it was, but I remember that series in 2017. My co-founder and I would just play the podcast. We would listen to like three minutes. We'd be like, did you understand that? Nope, didn't get that. All right, <laughs> Google something. <laughs> but I feel like a lot of people got pulled into the industry that way. So Jan, I want to start actually with macro before getting into crypto. I've actually heard you describe Vanek uh, not as an ETF provider or ETF firm, but as a macro firm at a, at a whole. I'd be curious, what do you think is the, when you think about just the macro landscape right now, we've got this like yield curve that's flipped upside down. You've got I feel like the, the debt crisis is what everyone's talking about right now. We had commercial bank, you know, commercial banks collapsing six months ago. What are you paying attention to right now in macro? What do you think is the most important thing in macro right now? Sure. Let me let me talk uh, talk about what I what I mean by macro. And and what I mean is that there's a lot of people who build their whole career around looking within the Bloomberg, like all the dynamics within the financial markets. And we say, hey, wait a minute, before you do that, take a step back. What's happening in the world from a political, economic, and technology perspective? Because some of those trends are going to be very important and very investable. So the way you know TradFi people think about their portfolios and asset classes, very simply, take the rise of China. Right, Deng Xiaoping moves as a country towards open markets. There is no asset class called emerging markets, but there is this clear political move in one of the world's biggest countries. And you know, I traveled there in 92. I said, this is going to be one of the biggest moves in my career. And mm -hmm. so uh, that has uh, investment implications. So my, our point at Van Eck is, look at what's happening in the world. Let's have a dialogue with our clients. We don't know all the answers, but let's have a dialogue and say, hey, listen, what's likely to be sustainable in terms of trends? What's, what's likely to impact the financial markets and your portfolio from either a risk or return perspective? So, all right, to answer your question, um, the Fed is and interest rates are the biggest driver of financial markets, no doubt, right? And so the Fed has said, there's one time where you really don't want to be invested in stocks and bonds as a TradFi person, and that's when the Fed is raising rates. And the Fed said, hey, we're going to raise rates aggressively. They're clearly 90% done with the raising rates part. The second part, which doesn't get enough airtime in my mind, is what they're doing with their balance sheet. It's the quantitative easing moving to quantitative tightening. And if you listen to that narrative, what that, what that means is there's no, to oversimplify, no government coming to the table in the bond market anymore. So since the financial crisis, every day, I, I kind of exaggerate, but either foreign central banks or the U.S. central bank was bidding up a lot of the bonds. And it wasn't just U.S. treasuries, right? It was mortgage backs. You know, the Swiss central bank bought all kinds of different investments in their balance sheet. So that, that, if that game is over, then who is setting the prices of interest rates in the United States? Well, it's the private investor. And if that's the case, then to me, it's very clear that 10-year rates should be higher than one month or three months short-term interest rates. Why? Because the risk of interest price movement out the further out 
is dramatic. So more risk, more return. And so I think if you go, you know, say the Fed is 90% done with raising rates at the short end, eventually we're going, and shortly, I think, we're going to have an inverted yield curve. I started saying this a week ago, and now we're almost there, it feels like. And we don't know the path that we're going to get there, Jason. I think that's an important question to ask. You know, does the 10-year go to 6.5% and then the whole curve shift? That, that I don't really know. But yeah, this chart is, is the best indicator. Uh, what it does goes back to the 1980s. And what you can see in green is that's when the 10-year interest rates are higher than uh, normalized yield curve, higher than the three-month. Right, so this period where long-term interest rates are lower in red is very rare, um, and it doesn't persist. And so it's all down to people's psychology of do they think the Fed's going to come back and intervene in the bond markets or not? Hmm. I'm betting not, and so I bet on a normalized yield curve. Hmm. Okay, so but we we so we have this inverted bond market right now, which doesn't really make sense, right? Less yield for more risk. How do you get out of that if you're if you're the Fed? Well, if you just keep doing quantitative tightening and stop interfering in the market, it will happen. Uh, what's, what's funny is when you debate with people is when you have regime changes like this, right? Because this has been something that's been around since the financial crisis. And frankly, a lot of people in, our, in, in the investment industry uh, haven't you know, really kind of experienced this sort of combination of inflation and the Fed fighting inflation, which happened in the 70s. Uh, it just takes a long time for, for these changes to kind of get into people's psychology. But if, if quantitative tightening continues and the Fed really doesn't come back, the market will it'll normalize the yield curve. That's just normal behavior. Uh, I think the question, the tough call is, OK, so what, Jan? <laughs> what does that mean for my portfolio? Um, and I think one thing that, you know, to, to jump to the, to the crypto is I do think that the hedges against, um, you know, kind of higher interest rates are bad for, for gold. That's, that's for sure a well-established <laughs> narrative. If Bitcoin is the modern gold, then I think high rates are bad for Bitcoin. And that would explain kind of the, the bear market that we've seen. Uh, I don't think for Bitcoin matches gold one for one. I call it like an eight-year-old, like a, an underdeveloped asset. But I do think that this is the time, if you believe that you want to be positioned for an eventual change in Fed policy, you have no idea when the market's going to price it in, you know, do your buying now. Hmm. When you talk about a regime change, there's two things that come into my mind. There's what I like a short-term regime change with a presidential election next year, but then there's the like the this uh, colossal regime change around the dollar. And I think the big conversation right now at dinner tables with if you meet with you know, portfolio managers, which I know you do a lot of, is the budget deficit. I'd be curious how you think about the concern of the budget deficit and really maybe the, the timeline of the concern there. Yeah, listen, the hardest thing in financial markets is timing. Uh, so that's why if you can do your portfolio construction with a big time budget, that's super helpful. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, many people have, have gotten caught up in, in you know, predicting the decline of Japanese yen or whatever based on these kinds of budget analyses. So this, uh, these charts here are just straightforward. They're, they're not even anyone else's guess. It's the CBO. So this is what the government is saying. And it just shows, given our mix of fiscal policies, that interest costs, even at basically current levels, as you can see on the right, are going to become a crazy amount of government spending. Now, this is a very static view of the world. Uh, I'm probably in the in the more half uh, glass half full camp where there's a lot of policy changes, whether it's you know raising the retirement age or uh, hmm. you know reducing the amount of benefits that are spent and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it would have to be bipartisan. So I'm not saying this is like baked in the cake, uh, but the timing is is very difficult. And if you could go to the the next slide, um, I, I, a lot of life is you know kind of in the financial markets, there's so many thousands of charts and data points. It's like, what's the one that speaks to you? So, because it, it could very well be, Jason, that we live another 20 or 30 years 
and the dollar doesn't collapse and you know this interest rates don't skyrocket because of the US's fiscal position. But here's my favorite uh, sort of data point, which is it's a little complicated, but it's basically the chances that the market thinks that the government, US government's going to default on its debt. So these are effectively the market saying, I'm worried about, to me, the US federal budget deficit. You can see early in the chart goes back to 2008. Uh, there were a lot of concerns about uh, sol solvency of the US government. Then it kind of went away. It spiked earlier this year during the March shutdown um, you know, discussions, and it's kind of at an elevated level. But stepping back, these are not high levels to me. If you look at like what Deutsche Bank was during the financial crisis and all the kind of chances, it was like much higher. So I think we, you know, it feels like most macro strategists are bears. Um, a lot of them are my age, and they like <laughs> to stress the negative and inevitability of all these crises. And and maybe you know some Bitcoin maxis do too, but this is kind of nah, maybe not so much. Like yeah, it's a problem, but mm -hmm. you know maybe we can work our way through it. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of what I look at. Don't let's not get ahead of ourselves on the doomsday scenario. Yeah, though, if you go back to this slide like this, uh, the net interest cost as a percentage of revenue is um, I don't know, it does kind of make you think like if you if you expand, if you extend this out far enough, there's kind of three ways to fix this problem. Like what we're looking at is a problem and there's three ways to maybe address the problem. There's you can inflate away the debt costs. You can build your way out of it with maybe AI and or crypto as the catalyst, or you could forgive the debt. Is that Does that feel like a fair assessment of this? Well, I would adjust forgive and say, um, tweak your promises. <laughs> yes. And some of those are intergenerational <clears throat> concerns. So, okay, old people like me have been working in the market. I'm not going to change your retirement age, but you know, youngsters like you... Yeah, maybe you have to work till you're 90 or something. <laughs> so uh, something that's more demographically appropriate. So, yeah, um, I don't think it has to be. A f My point is, it doesn't have to be a flat out default. If you just change some of these assumptions, you can bend this curve. Yeah, that's interesting. I'd be curious how you think about uh, a lot of founders that I talk to. And our, you know, Mike and I have these conversations all the time is like, what's happening in 2024? And it feels like when I think about the economy, if someone told me two years ago that the Fed was about to rate hike rates by you know 500 points, impending recession, imminent, right? But it does feel like there's been these like pockets of recessions, like B2B SaaS had a big recession and there are big layoffs, but it doesn't feel like the economy has had a big recession. Um, and it feels like the economy almost like sidestepped these rate hikes. Is that how you view the economy as well right now, responding to the rate hikes? Or I'd be curious how you, how you think about that now and how you think about that as you look forward to 2024? Yeah, I mean, my biggest um, factor when I think about the economy is actually the labor market. And the labor mm. market is just yeah. so strong. And so whether you look at unemployment statistics, um, you know, the par participation rates have started to normalize uh, po post-COVID. But frankly, I mean, I see this all with all my coworkers and, and, and everyone you talk to in the economy, right? Their mm. attitudes towards work have changed whether it's work towards, you know, work from home or whatever. Um, and, and, the, and listen, the consumer is super strong. Corporate America is super strong. Yes, there's a, you know, kind of refinancing risk a couple of years out, but it's really the government <laughs> that paid for all the, the bills on COVID, right? None of the rest of us did. So I, I feel like until that really manifests itself, I'm not, you know, that concerned about the economy. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the technical GDP numbers just, you know, to me, I'm like, well, listen, if we're at low, almost full employment, right, very low unemployment statistics, uh, that, that's, that's a good economy. Main Street's happy um, as long as inflation doesn't eat away all their earnings. Maybe you could actually share the the original Van Eck story and, you know, tied into gold. I've heard you share this wonderful story. I think it was your father started the firm and Gold. Yeah, right. You can you can share the story instead of me because I'll I'm sure I'll botch it, but would love to hear well, the original. Listen, story. it's 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 a it's this high conviction macro approach to the markets. So uh, I, my father started the firm in 1955, uh, and as an American, he said, "Listen, the the, the recovery and growth in uh, Germany and Japan after World War II is great, 
You can buy these companies cheaper than American companies. This is something that people should put in their portfolios. And the logistics at that point of actually buying international stocks in, in foreign currencies was much better to do in a mutual fund. So that was his thesis. Um, he was a little bit more of a, a wonk and an economist than a great <laughs> marketer. So the, the business didn't grow very much. Um, and then uh, as, as, the, uh, as the nerd that he was um, in his 40s, he decided to get a PhD in economics at night, even though he had two little kids at home and two jobs. And he studied under an Austrian economist that many crypto people know well, uh, Ludwig von Mises at NYU who convinced them that government spending um, and, and uh, you know, effectively money uh, easing was going to cause uh, inflation in the United States. At that point, uh, gold uh, was a way to take advantage of that, right? That was the established counter currency to everything. Um, but gold was fixed against the dollar. Um, and, and as I like to point out, it had been fixed against the dollar for the entirety of US history. Right. Gold really was the basis of value um, globally. And he said, listen, that that's going to break. Um, I, I don't know when, but it's going to break. Wow. So he sold 80 percent of his fund and bought gold mining shares, uh, which uh, he had to buy shares because buying gold was illegal. illegal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which is a crazy thing to do because of the price of gold had stayed flat. For, 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 for over, almost 200 years. Yeah. <laughs> it's a crazy and thing to do. <laughs> I, I recall like at the breakfast table, like, you know, tuning into 1010 Winds Radio and what was the gold fight, uh, price fixing in the morning. Uh, this was after it started moving. But for, for three years, um, the, the price of gold did not change against the dollar. And, you know, my dad would pull out this chart of home stake mining and the and the depression saying, well, you know, when there's uncertainty, gold shares can actually rally. But I mean, it was a, it was a, <laughs> it was an outlier story at best. Um, but then, you know, when uh, when we got off the gold stand in 71, you know, gold went from thirty five to eight hundred dollars an ounce. So, again, it's that wow. kind of macro view and understanding that what what historians I think appreciate more than everyone else is that the future, forget the past, the future can be a set of outcomes you that are crazier than, you know, everyone else sort of just pivots towards the, the recent past. So anyway, so that's the story um, yeah, of the, of the company. And, and I think I've learned a lot from that and it informs a lot about how we think about portfolios. And Jason, one last comment, you know, what I think is it's only odd for Americans Right. The rest of the world, you would never think, oh, I'm if you're Argentinian. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be 60, 40 invested in the Argentinian markets, you know, as the as the core and never question that. Ne never. <laughs> you would go broke within 10 years every every decade. Hmm. What do you think your dad would have thought about uh, about Bitcoin? Oh, I think he definitely would see its value. Hmm. I mean, he wasn't like a tech lover per se, but I think all the the logic behind it um, and the concerns about governments in general being unable to stop spending uh, is just something that resonated with him. Yeah. Uh, so when you think about the ideal portfolio, this like 60-40 portfolio, how much do you think the, uh, from, a, from a historical lens, like how do you think about how macro and technology changes impact that 60-40 portfolio? Does the portfolio allocation change or does what's inside the 60 and the 40 change? That's what I focus on, right? So mm -hmm. if you think about, as I do, most, most crypto, um, ex-Bitcoin, ex as just aggressive growth investments, that's the sleeve, right, um, that it should come out of your portfolio if you're you know, ag more aggressive and the 60% is equities. You know, it's just sort of saying, listen, A, if you want some growth exposure, this is something you should definitely consider as disruptive change, number one. And number two, be aware of the other parts of your equity portfolio, what might get disrupted, what you know might lose value uh, because of this uh, technology. Um, on the fixed income side, and I won't do a long diversion there, uh, there are a lot of exciting options in, in fixed income as well. So I, I've been very bullish fixed income coming into this year. But it's certainly not just by the tenure, right? There's a lot of uh, investment grade paper available at the short end that was 
high single digits. Yeah. Are Bitcoin and ETH in your mind, when you start to think about it, there's almost two ways I wanted to ask you about, about crypto as a whole. There's as the investment for financial advisors and, and for por- portfolio managers. And then there's the crypto as a corporate strategy, basically. Um, but maybe we can start with the investment. How yeah, do you- ETH, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, Ethan, Ethan, and a lot of the over, uh, other really foundational projects to me are growth. You know, kind of investments through the token or the or the VC. So ETH is almost more of a technology investment. Bitcoin's more of the digital gold investment. To that. Ex- exactly, and yeah. and I so for, you know, Jan's not a sixty. I you know, I shouldn't even say sixty forty or forty sixty, right? Because Jan's probably a, a sixty thirty ten person. Like I, you know. I'm probably more tactical than my dad would have been, but I definitely want gold and Bitcoin in my portfolio, knowing that the biggest risk is out there, the federal budget deficit. And so mm-hmm. and and given that we know that, well, we don't know, but we, I think that we're near the end of this Fed cycle of tightening. We're certainly closer to the end than the beginning. Then then don't don't try to guess the timing of the move. Listen, crypto people will be like, you're crazy. The happening is next year. Like you're insane. This is the best tactical you know, opportunity. I think of it more just if you look at the Fed cycle, uh, you don't know the timing of when this gets priced in. And it, it's, this is a great time to own it. But I've been saying that for several months. Yeah. I've got, a, I've got a tweet lined up for you that I'll tell you on the podcast, which is we've got Q1 Bitcoin ETF launches. Q2, we've got the halving. Q3, we've got rate cuts ahead of the election. How do we feel about, uh, and that, I mean, lines up with the kind of historic four-year Bitcoin cycle. How do we, uh, how do we feel about that? Um, if one is cynical about the election, then you want at least six months for uh, lower rates to kick in. So I'd be like a very exciting spring with the happening um, and the Bitcoin ETF, but, uh, and, and, and rates being cut all, maybe all at the same time. Yeah. What do you think the uh, so you guys fought, uh, you guys got into the ETF business a lot earlier than a lot of other folks? You guys saw the kind of writing on the wall with ETFs. I think it was two thousand six. I want to say yeah. Um, and then you, I think, filed for your first Bitcoin ETF in twenty seventeen. What do you think the? I want to start to transition this into the Van Eck products around crypto. And Martin, we'll uh, we'll bring you in in a second here. Thanks for being patient with us. But um, what do you think the likelihood that a Bitcoin ETF gets approved in twenty twenty three? is, which is probably very low likely, likelihood, versus maybe March of 2024, which is when I know a lot of folks are waiting for that timeline. Um, there's, what I can say is there's obviously movement at the SEC now, um, yeah. where yeah. There, there was absolutely no movement until a month ago. Mm. So whether it's just, you know, Dece- I have no idea, December or March, I, I, I'm not a mind reader. But what I would uh, point at to it, well, obviously they they didn't uh, appeal the grayscale decision, but um, I think more interestingly, you should look at and it, listen. It's super frustrating to Van Eck because we were first to file in almost all of these categories, like by years, like ETH spot, ETH futures, Bitcoin futures, like anyway. But it, we are where we are, and the SEC said, listen, we don't want to give anyone an issue or an unfair advantage. So what they did with ETH futures is they fe- effectively said to the firms that had shown an interest in that, we're going to try to get you all to market on the same day. And they did. It's really the first time in ETF history where something like that has happened. Now, there wasn't a lot of market demand for, for the <laughs> ETH futures products. Uh, so I would imagine a similar thing is in their mind for, for uh, spot Bitcoin. Is the Bitcoin ETF important because it puts a stamp of approval on the industry or because it basically allows financial advisors to be able to recommend this for the first time? Like, why, why is this such an important milestone? Well, listen, uh, two things. One is more symbolic than anything else. No. Uh, I mean, it's important because everyone thinks it's important. Um, so you have this circular argument, you know, I, I like gold, uh, I like Bitcoin, you know, what's the value or well, the value in it? is there's limited supply and then the crowd thinks it's valuable. But you go to like a Warren Buffett, he will never like gold, he will never like Bitcoin because there's no income stream associated with it. Not true for maybe some other crypto, but let's just say that for our argument's sake. Uh, so you get into the circular argument. Uh, so you know, to, to that extent, the spot Bitcoin ETF launching is important. Why? Because everyone thinks it's important. I mean, globally, everyone has yeah. their eye on the SEC on this. On this issue, but practically speaking, it's going to be a, break, a great product as well. 
So if you look at the spot Bitcoin products that trade in Canada, Brazil, and Europe, they trade at really tight spreads. And the infrastructure, I mean, I, I don't like these institutions, Jason, don't get me wrong, but the established stock exchanges in around the world have very hardened infrastructure. So you're finding a product that trades really tight, uh, very reliably in a regulated manner. Um, and also it's super tax efficient for Americans. It's way, it's way mm. better than these futures based uh, Bitcoin and <clears throat> products. Mm. How would you recommend someone who has a large risk appetite be positioned in terms of like going into next year. So like I'm, so take someone like myself, like on, you know, on the younger side, like, like crypto a lot. How would you recommend someone like myself basically position their portfolio? All in. <laughs> All in. <laughs> I mean, Listen, who who knows? But it feels think- impo- the reason I ask is it feels impossible to position a portfolio in this market. Like I, I'm not sure if it's if it's ever felt easy, but like it does feel very difficult right now to try to think about how to allocate your portfolio. Listen, th- this whole thing could be a sham, like a lot of people think it is. Um, it could be that Web two companies adopt some crypto technology. Yeah. Some Wall Street firms do permission blockchains, and you and I will have other jobs in three years, right? It could be. But so you have to discount the future because no one knows, right? But if um, Bitcoin has now been established, which I think it has been, and I've thought so for five years, as an alternative, just like silver has or platinum, to demand for gold as a store of value, then you've got a almost close to perfect setup as a trade, right? Mm-hmm. You've got the, like you said it, your tweet storm of next spring, right? You've got the Fed changing its policy or you know, nearing the end of it. Uh, you've got the halvening. Um, you've got other uncertainties that are there. And you've got the liquidation that has occurred in the market. I mean, I've been involved in some really blown up asset classes in my career. Emerging market debt was was one of them, where the, the bonds issued by countries were trading at like four, five, ten cents on the dollar. Um, and so, you know, what do you see? You see everyone liquidating. You see the market makers liquidating. So there's no infrastructure. And now, I guess the narrative around the FTX. Uh, bankruptcy is their portfolio will be liquidated. I, I just can't imagine who else there is to sell. And if you look yeah. at the statistics on, you know, on chain and CFI sales of, of Bitcoin and other coins, I mean, it's all supportive of that simple story. The only thing that doesn't make sense is if ya, if this is true, what Jason and Jan are saying, then why doesn't the market price it in? And this is one of the mysteries of the financial markets. Like, you know, the happening always leads to a bull market. Why don't people? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've how many? I don't know how many you've lived through. Like, you were like, why don't people anticipate this? <laughs> and it, there's no accounting for the crowd. This episode is brought to you by Toku. Toku makes implementing global token compensation and incentive awards simple. With Toku, you get unmatched tax and legal support to grant and administer your global team's tokens. From easy to use token grant award templates through token vesting to managing tax withholdings, Toku understands every grant structure, token purchase agreements, restricted token awards, restricted token units, token options, token appreciation rights, and even phantom tokens. Tokens. For legal, finance, and HR teams, it is a huge, complex task to have to comply with global regulations around compensating people with tokens, not to mention the payroll, tax obligations, tax reporting in every country that you employ someone. It is difficult, time consuming, manual, and costly, and it is drawing more and more attention from regulators and governments. Toku makes this simple for leading teams across the space, protocol labs, DY. IDX Foundation, Mina Foundation, Hedera, Gnosis, Safe, Gitcoin, and a lot more. Reach out to Toku at toku.com forward slash empire or click the link in the description. Martin, let's, uh, I want to pull you in now. So I, uh, I've agreed with nearly everything Jan said so far, except, uh, well, I don't actually think he agreed, uh, would, would agree with this, but it's the Buffett thing about there's no cash flows in crypto. There, there are cash flows in crypto and it, and it, and it's, it comes from 
I know I know you don't actually think that, Jan. I said uh, Bitcoin, I said Bitcoin, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So no cash flows from Bitcoin, but there is something which is ETH. And uh, I know you spent a lot of time trying to think about um, okay, maybe it's not just an ETH, uh, like a spot ETH ETF, but maybe there's more that we can do. And maybe we can capture MEV and and give that back to institutions. Or maybe there's uh, something that we can do with um, uh, with staking. So I'd love to just hear more about like how you and and, and Market Vector and, Jan, and, and uh, Van Eck as a whole like are thinking about capturing more of the value, like what I'd call crypto native value and packaging that up for the institutional crowd. Can I, can I, sorry to interrupt, but let me just frame market vector, right? Yeah. So market vector is a wholly owned uh, subsidiary of Van Eck. Uh, it was when we set up our ETF business and had some ideas, we said, well, there is no good ETF, sorry, no index to track this ETF we want to do. Let's create our own. And, um, but market vector has grown beyond that. They have 100 non Van Eck clients and they have 20 non Van Eck crypto clients, right? Including Coinbase and a whole bunch of other people. So I just wanted to frame before Martin answers that more narrow question. You know, we, we want to be a really um, thoughtful and research forward provider of data and indices in the industry. And, and so far, some other people have agreed with us. Hmm. So, when someone, so, when, so when someone wants to build an ETF, they will go to Market Vector? to help them construct that ETF? Yeah, that, I mean, the first retail uh, Bitcoin fund in Canada used one of our indices. We've got, you know, an ETF company in Brazil. We've got other companies in Europe uh, besides our, our own offering. So, yeah, sorry. I, I will now be quiet and self-mute. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, it's a good question before we start with ETH, maybe why an index? Yeah, because uh, in, in crypto, there is no standard. And especially if I ask you for the Bitcoin price, yeah, what's the Bitcoin price? Do you look at Coinbase, at Binance, uh, at Bitfinex? There are huge uh, differences. And so we, we really have sophisticated algorithms, uh, weighted exchanges uh, to come up with a reliable reference price, uh, which is important for an ETF, especially for regulated products, but also for derivatives. And so um, we do that for a lot of single token uh, indexes, but also um, baskets, of course. And uh, when we come to Ethereum, uh, I think the latest innovation and, and, and the thing I really am excited about is uh, that we finally have uh, uh, a cash flow product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the, and we talked about the rates market, right? Um, it's a huge market in, in, in TreadFi. Yeah. If you look uh, at the derivatives market, yeah, it, it, at uh, ISTA figures, I think. Uh, swap markets is around $500 trillion, yeah, trillion with a T. Uh, and, and I ask you, how large is the rates market in crypto? Zero, more or less, right? And so with the change from proof of work to proof of stake in Ethereum, I think uh, it, it really uh, is the new driving force. And suddenly uh, you have... A cash flow, which is, I mean, a lot of people say it's a risk-free rate, that the staking rewards rate. I have a problem with risk-free, but I would say it's the lowest risk rate you can get in crypto when you compare that with lending your USDC out where you have counterparty risk or uh, if you are in a liquidity pool and, and facing permanent loss. So what we did here um, is that um, together with our partner Figment, uh, we asked the question, what is the staking rewards rate? Because if you look at Coinbase, yeah, if you stake at Coinbase, Kraken, Figment, Blockdemon, they all have different staking rewards rate. Yeah? Um, and what we see here is we index size the whole Ethereum chain, so all 800,000 plus validators, and come up with a daily annualized staking rewards rate or mm. staker rate. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> comparable what you have in the money market with uh, LIBOR or now software. And if you go back to this um, daily rate, I think it's uh, slide three, right? What you see is there are two components. Yeah. There are the consensus layer rewards. Uh, that's the orange area, which is basically. Um, uh, the inflation, yeah, the newly minted ETH. And what is super interesting is the execution layer reward, 
you get since the merge, since September 2022. Yeah, that's basically the priority fees and the MEV part. And and I'd like to say it's the heartbeat of Ethereum, because whenever the economic activity is high, the rate is shooting up. And here I love this chart. Yeah? I mean, if you do the deep dive, so what is uh, what are layer ones doing? They sell block space, right? And whenever block space demand is high, yeah, people are getting crazy. They are bidding high transaction fees. There are a lot of MAV opportunities, and then this 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 rate is shooting up. Yeah, and you saw that during the FTX debacle. Yeah, when people wanted to get their assets off the exchange to their wallet. Um, or uh, an extreme example is uh, the March banking crisis we had. So the staking rate shoot up from 7% to almost 16% in a day and then down 7%. Why? Because um, Silicon Valley Bank went under. Uh, uh, USDC had large deposits at this bank and suddenly we had this DPEC. So a lot of people were selling their USDC and bidding up the fees again. And it doesn't always have to be related to negative events. As yeah, so you see, for example, during this Pepe meme coin craziness, yeah, we also had a lot of block space demand um, and uh, during the curve exploit. So what's interesting is um, you can look at a plethora of on-chain fundamentals or you can just look at our uh, staker rate to see hmm. what is going on on the Ethereum chain. Why is this so important? Um, to unlock financial innovation, you need a benchmark. You need some kind of standardization. Yeah? As I talk to you, yeah, you can't use different staking rates from Coinbase or Block Demon or what have you. Um, whenever you have standardization, the commodities market, yeah, standardized futures markets, standardized uh, tenors and notional values, um, you suddenly need that too for this Ethereum rate. And with this um, benchmark rate, you can really do a lot of uh, interesting things. Yeah? For example, um, you can do swaps on this take rate. Yeah? For example, if you're a validator and you get the variable rate uh, and you want to have a fixed rate, maybe you get into an, to an uh, fixed to variable swap with a hedge fund who wants to bet on the movement of this uh, variable rate and you suddenly exchange this, yeah? Mm. Um, you can also do basis swaps and merge two worlds with, uh, for example, you go along the staker rate and you get, sh get short the Fed funds rate, for example. Which, which is um, very similar. Like basically what you're saying is, all right, so now you have this base rate in DeFi and what that does is it unlocks a bunch of financial in innovation on chain. So if you think about like, uh, interest yeah. rate swaps, for example, uh, a company wouldn't be able to take out a variable, you know, rate loan, or that could crush them. Or my mortgage, for example, like I got a fixed rate mortgage because I didn't want a variable rate mortgage. Those pro types of products don't yet exist in DeFi because right. there's no rate. So, right. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, if you lend your ETH out, on what rate is this based? I mean, now it's a, a, a bilateral negotiated uh, rate based on, I don't know, but it should be at least based on the staker rate plus a spread, for example. Mm -hmm. And so um, what we also did is, um, and I think why, getting back to this, um, why this could be an, a really an important benchmark for the crypto space, um, what I like about the staking is it's, it's non-custodial. Yes, yeah, so you have no counterparty risk. And um, that's, I think, an, an, an important differentiator when it comes to the rates you, you normally have. Yeah, uh, And you have no smart contract risk as all the things are enshrined in, in the base protocol. Yeah. Um, I think a more intuitive product is if you apply the staking rewards rate to an existing Ethereum product, yeah, to the price index, to come up with a real total return product. Yeah. And that's something you see on slide, um, on the next slide or this, uh, slide seven. Yes. So we are all familiar with the uh, plain vanilla Ethereum products. Um, 
but um, why shouldn't you get the Ethereum price plus the rewards? Yeah, similar to if you invest in a stock fund, yeah, you get the stock price, the stock price development, and the dividend. Yeah, you don't talk to the portfolio manager and say, uh, keep the dividend. Yeah, I'm just interested in the price development. And what you see here, we've done that for our normal market vector mm. Ethereum index. That's the purple line. So since the merge, it's basically flat. But if you include the staking rewards rate, you're suddenly up 15%. Huh. And that's, yeah. our, uh, that's here compounded. Uh, you can set this index with the compounding feature. So for example, um, let's say you have a large fund, you can set up new validators for the, um, with the ETH you've, you've earned. You can also set that just for uh, accumulation. But I think it's, it's really intuitive that you see, okay, um, in the long term, um, I think that will establish as a standard. Yeah. yeah. And Jan, when you think about this and you, I mean, you meet more portfolio managers and financial advisors than most people on this earth. What is the demand for something like this? Are they talking about staking and talking about capturing MEV rewards or this is uh, you're maybe planning for 20, 2030 by building things like this? Yeah. I mean, Martin could probably answer the question better than me because this isn't something that's easily uh, deliverable through an ETF because the uh, ETFs, right, you can't stake because you need to have the daily liquidity. So I think it would be for other financial advisors. I think um, if you ask me a question today, where's the... You used to have this concept in emerging markets called crossover money because the emerging markets <laughs> people were all weirdos, right? And they had passports and things like that. And most people were trading U.S. government bonds or corporate bonds. But once in a while, things became so you know interesting. There was this crossover demand, which is huge. If you ask me what the biggest crossover demand potential is in crypto right now, I think it's people buying Bitcoin like macro funds. And this is, I think, some of the narrative out of BlackRock as well, where through their Aladdin technology platform, I think they see, um, you know, I'm guessing, but I think they see a lot of crossover generalist investors saying, you know what, I, I'd like to leg into Bitcoin here as a tactical trade. So it, I think there is demand in the crypto ecosystem for exactly what Martin was talking about, but I think that's probably smaller than the Bitcoin crossover trade. Yeah. So it's funny because, or Martin, anything you'd add to that? I think you have to have a global perspective. Um, I, I do think um, in the US, uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, we are happy if we get the spot Bitcoin ETF and then a plain vanilla Ethereum ETF, right? Um, but we are really talking uh, with European investors who are interested in it, also with Asian investors. And the liquidity part is something... I think you can solve. Yeah, you don't have to stake 100% of your portfolio. So you can set a utilization ratio, meaning the proportion of your fund, maybe just 30, 40% is, is staked with the staking as a service provider. Hmm. And in addition to that, you operate with a liquid staking derivative, right? For example, with a liquid hmm. collective, uh, yep. they also do KYC, AML. And then suddenly you, you can play around with it. So uh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because we're talking about, I would call this a very crypto native product. And it actually ties into a question I wanted to ask you, Jan. Um, when I look at the Van Eck Twitter, which I'm going to link to the Twitter in the show notes because it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very fun Twitter account, I would say. When I think about Van Eck, very traditional firm, been around you know, 70-ish years. Uh, when I look at the Twitter, it is run by a very crypto native, probably on the younger side, like type of person. And that's telling me a little bit about how you view who your end customer might be. Maybe not now, but maybe in the future. Who, who is, so I guess I'd just ask you point blank, who is your end customer and how crypto native is that person when, when you, when you picture someone in your head? Uh, we have very different customers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, our TradFi, I mean, our TradFi and, and crypto customers, there's almost no, a Venn diagram and there's no overlap. Um, it, it's really crazy. Um, so to your point, yes, on our Twitter account, we're trying to reach our crypto native uh, uh, customers. And, you know, crypto Twitters or FinTwits, a big, a big thing. You know, you and I talked about VanX strategy and crypto and all this kind of stuff. And I think um, 
you know, big, big picture, it's just been super frustrating how hard it is in the U.S. regulatory environment to get more crypto native faster, right? If you believe that the technology offers cost uh, and networking advantages to users and can disrupt existing um, cost structures, wow, it's fr- <laughs> the last several years have been pretty frustrating how fast that moves. So I almost feel like we're trying to keep our crypto native friends uh, entertained um, and engaged while uh, we kind of catch up to that that potential. Yeah. How, how deep do you think about when you when you think about your corporate strategy as a whole, and you're doing, you know, it's October, doing end of year planning, thinking about the future. How deep do you want to push into crypto? Like, will you start running nodes, for example? Will you become an LP on chain? Like, how, how deep do you see your Vanek pushing into crypto? Um, so sort of since our reemergence after DeFi summer in 2020, we, we've gotten pretty aggressive. We have an active research and investing team here out of New York. We've expanded. Uh, we, we offer 12 uh, funds in Europe that offer exposure to, to one or more tokens. Um, you know, we've talked about Martin's effort. So uh, but we have some on chain. Uh, I mean, we've invested through venture capital funds that connect us directly to developers uh, and we are partnering with, um, well, well, we have actually, this is for its topic for another day. We have our own uh, on-chain project um, ourselves, but we're also partnering with a lot of those projects. So mm-hmm. it's very important that we do that in a very regulatory compliant manner because that's our firm's ethos um, to, to begin with. Uh, but, you know, as we know, the, the rest of the world is much more friendly towards these kind of developments, you know, especially Europe. And I think that was Martin's point. And a lot of there's a lot of liquidity and interest that comes out of Asia, even, you know, forgetting kind of recent uh, developments in Hong Kong and Singapore. So, um, yeah, it's stuff they can't fully talk about now, but very much yeah. feel like uh, outsider looking in. Uh, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. I mean, we've seen it, right, because we have all this insights into who's listening to our podcast, who's reading our newsletters, who's attending our conferences. And we made the decision, I was telling you over the weekend, to move our digital asset summit from we were going to do it in D.C. Turns out not a great idea to do it kind of in the belly of the beast. We're going to London, right? And the and the interest has been nuts for us. Um, I mean, what's, you know, just as an anecdote, what's interesting is, you know, some of my colleagues are meeting with banks in the Mideast and Asia, and they have a mandate almost from the government that they have to have crypto capabilities, right? Uh, one of the biggest banks in Japan, I'm not sure if this is public yet or not, so I won't say the name, but they are offering staking rewards to all of their customers, re- retail and institutional, and they're offering staking rewards. So Here we have it. That's with you guys? Yeah. No, no, that's not with us, uh, but um, I think that's another proof for the demand oh, yeah, yeah. of staking rewards. And may, maybe Warren Buffett some, someday invests in here, <laughs> right? I mean, he invests in not in gold, but in gold mining stocks. I mean, if you and think about it, like rewards. Yeah. the what I'm what 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 bank does Buffett own a lot of? At a Bank of America or some one Wells Fargo, one, one of those big ones. And uh, the what I'm earning in my Bank of America account right now is. I don't even know if I'm earning anything. I don't even know if I'm getting any yield if I just sit in cash in my Bank of America account. There's you could quickly see a future using a, I don't know, maybe using your guys's product where the cash in my account you could either allocate it to Treasuries, right, or you could start to allocate it to the to the staking rate. So, Martin, what, yes, what why the, not? Yeah, what what other products are you excited about right now? So uh, definitely uh, the staking thing, but uh, the other the other big innovation we will launch soon is uh, a new breed of, of baskets, yeah, fundamentally weighted. Uh, you know, normal baskets are market cap weighted, and I have to say it's a good starting point. Yeah, a market cap weighted index. If you know that you don't know anything, it's a good start. Um, but um, as you know, a lot of people sometimes, especially in the crypto space, then have problems with some of the tokens in the top 10. Yeah, for example, there's either nothing going on, for example, with Cardano, uh, or you have a meme token in it, Dogecoin, nobody wants to invest, or uh, they are still, it's surprising, but, but still uh, Litecoin, yeah, the poor man's Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin Cash is, is still top 10. 
And so we thought maybe we can improve the the selection process. Yeah, there's you have all these on-chain fundamentals real time, and why shouldn't we use that? And so um, we partnered with Token Terminal to get their data to use their data, and so we will select tokens and coins according to their economic traction, meaning what do they earn mm-hmm. uh, or uh, how many active users do they have yeah, to account for, for network effects yeah, and adoption. And the interesting thing is that um, it's, it, it looks a little bit different. Yes, you still have Bitcoin and Ethereum, but um, you are catching more of, of the smaller altcoins earlier. For example, an, an actual snapshot would also consider Arbitrum Layer 2 or Lido, uh, which, which would never enter a classic uh, top 10 index. Yeah? So we will do a top 10 fundamental index, and uh, that will allow for, for investors who are yeah, maybe more deep into it and, and, and want a, a second iteration, also an iteration which performs better than our market cap. You know, I just like to say to yeah. say to our traditional customers, say, like, what are you doing with crypto? It's all speculative. And I say very quickly, look, there's 20,000 tokens out there that represent software projects. But there are a handful, the 50 or 100, that actually generate some kind of fee income, uh, either directly or through their ecosystem. That's what we're paying attention to, right? And why can't you do analysis on that income stream and that possibility, just like a traditional company? So it's it's sort of, yes, let's create an index. I'm so excited by what Martin is doing that actually takes away. Listen, Dogecoin's great, but it's all optionality at this point. So let's just take out those kind of investments um, <laughs> because they're very speculative and Look, maybe all of crypto is speculative, but there's there's shades. So yeah. um, I find this that's great. Of, I mean, we it's the conversation that we have internally, uh, especially on the uh, on the research side of our business with with Blockworks Research, which is uh, everyone basically treats these protocols as these like weird esoteric protocols, but a decent number of them now have real financials and real real user metrics, right? So why are we talking about MakerDAO as this like weird esoteric protocol? instead mm-hmm. of talking about it as something that'll do like 150 million in revenue this year and has a cost structure and has revenues and spits off profits, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. I, I love that you guys are doing that. Yeah, and it's still underestimated. Um, people still don't know that there are protocols producing, which produce cash flow, right? Um, they all think it's it's nothing, they do nothing. It's, it's, it's just price appreciation and, and that's not true. And, and I hope that we can change that with that index. And, and we definitely also have to do more uh, on the educational front. Yeah. yeah. Still, well, yeah. Folks can subscribe to Blockworks Research if they want to uh, see that sound. <laughs> um, For example, yes. Yeah. Actually, you guys are pretty active in our chat. Uh, we, have a, we have a subscriber only chat and there's some some Banek folks. Do you guys have a liquid fund? I feel like there's some people at your liquid fund who are in the yeah. chat. Yeah. Yeah, Pranav. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, um, uh, Jan, I heard you say in a podcast the other day, um, or it might have been with Mike on On the Margin earlier this year, that you thought a central bank could buy Bitcoin um, at some point in the next 12 months. I'm curious if you think that that, that has already happened or if you still th- think that that's a, uh, a high likelihood probability. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of, I guess, more specifically a frontier central bank, right? So not maybe the United States or Canada, but, uh, you know, as part of the evolution and maturation of Bitcoin going from an eight, eight-year-old to like a 12-year-old, uh, you know, there, there are some government institutions that, um, you know, are, are very close to that, right? They invest in, in mining assets, Right. So if you own a miner, then you're pretty close to getting an income stream in Bitcoin. Right. Last I checked. So, um, you know, so but but in a major symbolic way, I guess we probably haven't crossed that. But but absolutely. Um, I mean, you do have countries that in the short term are sort of dollarizing. So Ecuador, now Argentina with their election a couple of days ago. Uh, so the. We, we just forget how the rest of the world has a demand for an open payment uh, protocol. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's well said. And, the, and their central banks reflect understand that. Yeah. Jan, I said I wasn't going to bring up regulation, but I do have one question for you, which is um, 
I'd be curious if you think that this regulatory regime with 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 Gensler and stuff is everyone everyone I feel like I'm sure we're all on the same page that it might be feels like a bit of an overreach but uh do you think that this is where the U.S. is headed as a whole like it's just almost going to get worse and worse or do you think that this is just a spectrum and regulation tends to ebb and flow back and forth and we might be at a more intense point in that spectrum and then it will will ebb back um it's 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 kind of simpler than that I think if you look at Look at China, right? Under Deng Xiaoping, they adopted free market policies, 30 years of tremendous growth. Uh, Xi Jinping, a different mix of policies, right? Slower growth, more regulation. I think this is just a one administration to the next. Uh, although I'll caveat that with we don't know what a Republican administration would do with respect to crypto. So I think it's it's very much top down. Um, so, I, you know, I'm... I think policies can change dramatically. I mean, you see that for in so many areas between the you know between Biden and Trump. So yeah. we'll just have to see. Do you think a Republican administration would be more friendly to crypto? It's hard to know, right? It is. Yeah, I actually don't think they'd be more friendly. I just think they'd be more hands off, which inherently would probably be good. But who knows? I don't know. Um, all right, guys, this is a great chat. Anything, uh, Jan, anything I'm missing? Martin, anything that, uh, that you really wanted to talk about? Maybe, maybe from a European perspective, yeah, because you asked, this is a big thing, the, the US ETF. And I think, although, or despite having a very pro crypto regulation in Europe, it had no price impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you have the announcement in the US with the spot Bitcoin ETFs and, and everything is blowing up to, to, to 30 K. And I think. We still need the U.S. Yeah, to 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 lead this and and to to have higher adoption and 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 uh, I think that's also good for Europe and and for the rest of the world. Yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah. I, I would say I do think for crypto um, and I mean more ETH plus plus to get out of this bear market, there has to be better user adoption. I, there's so much development happening, um, you know, compared to 2017, it's a different order of magnitude. But even compared to 2020, there's so many projects with potential, even with Web2 companies. But I kind of feel like real adoption and on-chain activity is going to have to drive a bull market in crypto here. I think Bitcoin is a different kind of asset, as we've t talked about. But I do think that's possible. Like, you know, I, I, I like the Solana, you know, Visa kind of project. Boy, man, if you get some traction around that, it, it's it's the fact that we pay 3% on all, all credit card transactions in the United States is insane. It's insane. Yeah. Do you think that'll be led by what I'd bucket as like stable coins and DeFi? Or will that be led by maybe something like decentralized social or on-chain gaming? Which which side of that I'm, I'm a payments defi guy but i will i work on wall street like what do you expect i'm with you i'm i'm, I'm with you i'm with you cool um all right guys this is awesome jan really appreciate it martin really appreciate it as well thank you so much uh, thank excited, you. very excited about this big macro firm 70 plus years old pushing pushing deeper into crypto it's really cool to see so congrats on everything thanks jason yeah. thank you very much